the grace, the mercy, and the peace of God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, be and abide with each one of you. Amen. That hymn we just sang, that's an old hymn. It's been around a long time. It's an old German hymn. It's been around a long time. And yet the words are as new and fresh to us today as they were when it was first written. By grace I'm saved, grace free and boundless, my soul believe and doubt it not. Why stagger at this word of promise? Has scripture ever falsehood taught? No. Then this word must true remain. By grace you too will life obtain. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Our gracious God and Father, we come to you today praising you for the grace that has been bestowed upon us through the working of our Lord Jesus Christ. A grace that has been placed over us and in us by the working of your Holy Spirit. We ask that we now continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Open our hearts to your word and guide the words of my mouth that they might be acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today, our focus is upon grace alone. That's one of those foundation stones of the Reformation. So today, it's grace alone. And, and as I said, that hymn, even though it's an old hymn, says it all says it all right there in those beautiful words that are proposed to us that we sang loudly. And I, I really appreciate your singing of that hymn. Grace is seen throughout all of the text today. Whether it was Isaiah chapter 25, whether it was the Gospel reading in Matthew, whether it was Philippians, or whether it was even Psalm 23, grace was there, even though the word may not have been mentioned, Grace was there because something that was mentioned is salvation. And you can't talk about salvation unless you talk about the grace of God. Because you can't have salvation except through the grace of God. Now, I think it's very important to keep something in mind, too. The early Christians had this emphasized to them through the apostles. They knew what grace was all about. They fixed their eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of their faith. But as time went on, this grace began to be taken for granted, and people started getting things messed up. Because the grace was looked on as something that became only a starting point for life, and not the whole total embodiment of our life in Christ. In other words, it was a starting point and you had to do the rest. That's not what comes out in our scriptures today. Because God does it all. As I started looking at these scriptures and breaking them down verse by verse, even phrase by phrase, throughout that Isaiah text, throughout the, the Psalm 23, throughout the gospel, you hear this, he did this, he did that, he did this. It's all God. You see, salvation belongs to God. We're told that already in Psalm 51, an old uh, part of the liturgy that we have grown to sing, Create in me a clean heart, O God. And then it says, Restore unto me the joy, not of my salvation, but of your salvation, because that's where salvation begins, and that's who controls salvation. It's God's salvation. Salvation, for us, belongs to God, and salvation, we have to keep something in mind, is a result of mankind's spiritual need. You see, Adam and Eve didn't need the hope of salvation before the fall. They already had it. They had everything that salvation offered. They could walk and talk with their Lord. Everything they did was in harmony with Him. Creation was in harmony with God, their Creator, and with them as well. 
It was only until sin came into the picture that suddenly everything changed and sin defiled the spirit of God's human creatures and wrecked the harmony that he desired and that he had created with all of his creation as well. And even worse, there was a veil covering all of creation, the veil of death, which was stated simply in the words, from dust you were taken to dust you shall return. But death was that veil that covered all humanity, in fact, all of creation, so much so that even St. Paul said to the Romans, all creation groans under the weight of our sin. Salvation belongs to God. Salvation began in the very heart of God. He loved his creatures in spite of their sin. He loved them so much he didn't want them to be destroyed and lost forever. And in Eden's garden he promised to them salvation. I will provide for you salvation and salvation will involve redeeming you from the sin that now defiles you and restoring it all back to how I desired it to be from the beginning. And that salvation plan was fleshed out in Jesus. Jesus, that promised seed of the woman, his becoming flesh prepared him to suffer and die for, for sinners like us and like Adam and Eve. And in his resurrection, he lifted the veil of death that covered us because he broke through that veil by his glorious resurrection and someday he promises that veil will be lifted forever. Salvation does not have a veil of death over it. Salvation has only life over it. Salvation is God's gift to us by grace. God wants us to taste the goodness of his salvation. That's why he invites us in that gospel reading to the wedding feast of the Lamb. He invites us to this part of the wedding feast as well, while we're struggling on this side of eternity. And God wants the wedding hall filled with people. For God so loved the world, the whole world, and everyone is invited. No one is desired to be left out. He even prepares the feast, that's grace, and he even provides the party clothes, and that's grace. The feast was completed on Calvary, and at the garden tomb, the wedding garments are the robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. His gracious invitation goes out to everyone. However, some choose not to receive it as we heard. And even if they come, some refuse to wear the right party clothes provided and are cast out. For well, yet others come to enjoy the festivities and the company of the Lamb. We are saved by grace, and because of that, we are also empowered by the Holy Spirit to live by grace. Living by grace, we need not fear the stark reality of death, the fearful veil that has been lifted by Christ when he overcame death. He leads us through the valley of death's shadow, and as we realize that shadows cannot harm us, because he is our guide, our guard and our shepherd. Living by grace, we need not fear the harsh reality of life as well. We can rejoice in the Lord always. You know, when Paul wrote those words, you know where he was. He was in a Roman jail cell, waiting to be killed. But he wrote to the, the Philippians and he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'm going to say it. Rejoice, he said, in spite of what life dishes out. In spite of what all comes your way, rejoice in the Lord. Because our life is not just for this side of eternity. We have salvation by God's grace. And in rejoicing, in spite of all the things that happen to us, we then are showing how powerful that grace is in our daily life. We're invited to bring all of our concerns, he says, to God in prayer. God does not want us to be anxious about life situations. He invites us to bring all of our requests to him by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That's what he says. 
We're invited to soak up and enjoy God's peace. A peace that surpasses all human understanding that guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Living by grace means to wrap our minds around godliness, not around the things of this world. There's a lot of bad news out there. There's a lot of things that try to rob us of that joy that, that God wants us to have in our life and that Paul calls us to express. He says instead of thinking about all the negatives, all the bad news, think about whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent, whatever is worthy of praise. He said, think about these things. Focus on God and His great salvation. Practice that which is gracious and godly and be assured that the God of peace will be with you. Living by grace, you will be content in every situation, Paul says. He learned how to do that in sparse times, in bountiful times, in plenty and in hunger, in abundance and in need. Living by grace enables us to say with St. Paul, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. God's salvation is all about grace. You know, there's that acronym that's been around for many, many years, and I know you're, you're very familiar with it. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. It hasn't changed. Christ went the way of the cross that we might have the riches of God, his salvation. That's grace. Nothing that we do merits it. It's freely given. It's freely given. And because of that, God's salvation is indeed all about grace. Grace alone. And we live in that joy and that peace. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.